In 1994, Atlas released Shin Megami Tensei IF, a spin-off of the original Shin Megami Tensei. IF took place in a high school setting, which proved popular. The player could choose between two playable characters, a male and female variant of the same protagonist. In 1996, Atlas released Persona, a successor to IF using a similar high school setting. The main character of IF made a cameo as an NPC. Her name was Tamaki. Atlas chose, in 1996, that the protagonist of their previous successful game would canonically be female. In 1999, Atlas released Persona 2 Innocent Sin, which also featured Tamaki as an NPC. A significant party member in that game was Jun Kurosu, a childhood friend of the protagonist Tatsuya. Jun has rather clear romantic feelings towards Tatsuya, and the player is allowed to choose Jun as a romantic partner toward the end of the game. This affects their in-combat negotiation, making this choice not only a one-off scene, but consistent throughout the remainder of the game. This choice isn't treated as a joke, and your other party members are surprised, but accepting. Jun is a good character. He's got things to atone for, and complicated relationships with his friends and family. He's among my favorite Persona characters, and I think that says something. So why am I telling you this? Well, it's to say that the Atlas of old was daring. Atlas made games for outsiders. If you weren't welcome at the cool kids' table, Atlas had a seat for you. It wasn't just Jun, it was all of their characters. Maki was sickly and bedridden, Ikichi was flamboyant and wild. In the original SMT, you met the Chaos Hero as he was being beaten by bullies. Notice that I said Chaos Hero, because even if he was ultimately your enemy, he was still a downtrodden outcast who worked to become more than that. Atlas made games for, well, the kids who liked video games too much. Atlas was punk, man. Atlas was out there for the little guy. And now, in 2020, Atlas is in hot water because of changes being made for the localization of Persona 5 Royal. In case you're unaware, 5 and 5 Royal contain a short scene which a lot of people view as homophobic. I'll link it on screen and in the description in case you haven't seen it, but in short, two adult gay men approach your party member Ryuji and aggressively hit on him. The scene ends with Ryuji getting dragged away with them, cue laugh track. Details are vague at time of writing, but the localization team is planning to change this scene outside of Japan. So why are people angry? Well, on one hand, you have those who don't think a localization change is enough. They want Atlas of Japan to recognize the potentially harmful content of this scene and change it in all versions, not just in foreign versions. On the other hand, you have those who think this constitutes censorship. And as your resident enlightened centrist, I feel I should weigh in and present the situation in a way that I think anyone can agree with. I do believe that the scene is homophobic. Not because I think it necessarily causes real-world harm, but because of the wider context of Persona and Atlas. First, Persona 5 features no non-straight or non-cisgendered characters, which I don't think is a crime in itself. No writer is obligated to include representation by default, as far as I'm concerned. But here, when the only characters in the game that are transparently anything other than straight also happen to be aggressive predators, it means the only gay representation that Persona 5 is willing to present is outwardly negative. Were Jun Kurosu or someone similar in the game, this scene would probably slip by easier, but it's a matter of unevenness. Second, the modern Persona games have a bit of unfortunate history with the LGBT community. Persona 3 had a pretty egregious chicks with dicks joke during the beach sequence, and Persona 4 had Yosuke, who frequently no-homoed the loving hell out of Kanji. Kanji, as well as Naoto, are similar sore spots, being that many people feel their arcs heavily implied they were gay and transgender respectively, but those implications were ultimately contradicted. Whether their arcs would have been stronger had they been LGBT is an argument I won't get into, but the point is that it's contentious. Persona 4 also has cut dialogue from that no-homo champ Yosuke, which heavily implies that he was planned as a potential gay romance option. Which would actually make a lot of sense given his character, in my opinion. And third is Persona 5's own recurrent themes. Among those themes are systemic abuse, sexual abuse, othering, victim complexes, power, and so on. I don't think I'm rattling any cages by saying that Persona 5, for the most part, takes sexual abuse very seriously, particularly the sexual abuse of powerless people. The entire first story arc of the game revolves around the villain Kamoshida, who is sexually abusing underage girls. Persona 5 is a game which prides itself on being about the little guys, the underclass who are fighting back against unjust systems. The protagonist has a criminal record for trying to prevent a woman from being assaulted by a politician. Han is a victim of the aforementioned sexual abuse, Ryuji is a victim of physical abuse, Yosuke is exploited by his adoptive father, Makoto is pushed around by every authority figure in her life, including her older sister, 
Futaba suffers from severe trauma and mental disorders, and Haru is forced into an arranged marriage with an abusive fiancé. But Persona 5 undermines its themes of underclass rebellion in many ways, and this is where we circle back to representation. While all of the protagonists have certainly suffered, the reality is many of them are also better off than most people who suffer those same abuses. An is a fashion model, Ryuji is a former track star, Makoto is a star student, Yusuke is a brilliant artist, and Haru is a literal billionaire heiress. And all of them, other than An, who has a partial foreign background, are members of the racial majority of their infamously xenophobic country. None of this is to say that their suffering isn't legitimate or important, but they are not people of low station in life. Being forced into marriage may be terrible for Haru, but it's far more terrible for the women of poor countries who don't happen to be inheriting billions of dollars. And let's not forget, for a game which is very insistent that adults shouldn't be chasing underage high school students, there sure are a lot of women the game allows your underage character to start relationships with. Including a teacher, the same position of authority that Kamoshida was in. Crazy how that works, huh? All of this combined is why scenes like the one being changed for Royal come off so poorly. Because underneath its veneer of progressivism, Persona 5 is not a game made for the underclass. Persona 5 is a game masquerading as fighting for the little guy from a position of inherited wealth, hand-me-down power, and inborn talent. The Phantom Thieves are well-off people who are gifted phenomenal magic power and frequently abuse or misuse it, only being good by virtue of being the lesser evil compared to the Demiurge. The protagonists of previous Persona games were often poor, orphaned, or traumatized, and they didn't have advantages to make up for that. Jun grew up orphaned by his crackpot father and with a mother who hated him, on top of his demonized sexuality which he could never express. Both of the Persona 3 protagonist's parents died in a car crash when he was a child. In the original Shin Megami Tensei, the protagonist's mother is eaten alive in front of him in the first hour of the game. So when Persona 5 tries to tell me that it's about the underclass, then outright mocks members of a real underclass, I can't see that as anything but the truth slipping out. But that's not all this is about. It's also a question of the rights of localizers to intentionally change something in this way. It's not a matter of localizing for the sake of helping a foreign audience understand, it's a matter of the localization team believing something to be wrong, or at least unmarketable, and changing it. So where do I stand on that? Well, I don't believe in censorship, and I don't believe in pretending that something isn't censorship just because it's minor. I won't get up in arms that some costumes were changed in the localization of Tokyo Mirage sessions, but I won't pretend it isn't censorship either. So no, I don't want the scene changed. But the big reason I don't want the scene changed is because I don't want Atlas to be able to hide this. I don't want the localization team to just slip this one under the rug and pretend like Atlas of Japan doesn't need to take a look at themselves. If this were any other company, I wouldn't bother getting annoyed about this, or making a video about it, because what game developer on this earth has a good track record with LGBT representation? The ones who are actually trying are struggling, and the ones who aren't struggling aren't trying. But this is Atlas, the outsider studio. The people who made games for weirdos and losers and people who never fit in anywhere else. They had this down. Maybe not perfectly, but name me three studios who have made a gay character half as nuanced as Jun Kurosu, especially in the 90s. Name me three studios who have said, you know what, the protagonist of our last game was female, and you can deal with it. And I mean, Catherine had a fairly well done transgender character all the way back in 2011. Atlas was special, but now it seems like they're too busy chasing mainstream money to care about the little people who help them build what they have. Atlas have always called their fans the Atlas Faithful because they were a company that you really could put your faith in, but it doesn't seem like that's the case anymore. I started this video with a quote from a member of the Atlas Old Guard, Kazuma Kaneko, and I want to end it on a reading of that exact same quote. Another thing that bothered me was the trend of the main character always being portrayed as someone special. A legendary warrior, for example. It was the equivalent of saying you can't succeed unless you're from a wealthy family, and I just couldn't stand that. I wasn't born with special genes, and I'm sure most other players weren't either. No matter who you are, if you're given a chance and have the guts to try your best, you can become a hero. That became the concept of Megami Tensei. Hey guys, thanks for watching my video. In case you hadn't noticed by now, I have some new channel art going on, a picture and a header. That is done by Emmanuel Esparza over on Twitter. I'll uh, put his at on the screen and down in the description. He does good stuff, you should check him out. Uh, I have a Twitter as well, in case you didn't know. That'll be again on the screen and in the description. 
You might be wondering where a certain video I've been talking about is, and the Pyre video will come after a documentary on its development comes out that I recently found out is, uh, is happening. I just want to make sure I have all the information I can before I really hardcore get to work on that video and try to put it out, so. That's where that is. Might take a little bit longer, but, you know, I, I don't have a schedule anyway. <laughs> I try to upload once a month, uh, but you can see that that doesn't always work out, so. Thanks for watching. Stick around for the next one, whenever that comes out. See you later.